thank you for joining us for the September Community Connection. I'm Brian Strand. This month, we're doing something a little bit different than normal. We're dedicating the bulk of the program to one segment. I recently had the opportunity to sit down and visit with retiring representative Connie Bernardi to talk about her years of service to our community as our representative in the State House. Representative Connie Bernardi has served the residents in the area for over 16 years. She has recently announced her retirement as has agreed to sit down and visit with us about her career. And thank you for joining us, Connie. It's great to be here, Brian. Um, I believe you are a long-term, almost lifetime uh, resident of the area. And would you like to uh, share with us some of your history growing up in, in the area and what it was like? Well, thanks. My, my parents moved here from southwestern Minnesota with little more than hope, courage, and the faith to pursue their American dream. And we came, um, they came to northeast Minneapolis, moved to Columbia Heights when I was five years old. I, we moved to Fridley where I started um, school in the Spring Lake Park School District. I love growing up in our community. I, I, I look at our community as a slice of Americana. But I also think of it in addition as like a, a slice of the world now. We have an amazing community and I'm just so, it was a great opportunity to grow up here. We have great schools in Fridley and our community members care so much about schools. And I had fun in the parks and recreation department in Fridley playing broom ball and doing um, softball and other different activities and um, just really enjoyed uh, the community in which I grew up. Okay, and you also represented the community as a Miss Fridley, I believe. Yes, I did. That was quite a few years ago, and that was an honor too. I remember when I grow when I grew up seeing all the Miss Fridleys that were above me. I really looked up to them and respected them. And ours was a scholarship program, and you um, you get a big scholarship when you um, get. To become Miss Fridley or one of the ambassadors, and the fun part is my daughter went on to serve as an ambassador for a Fridley Princess late, later on, and I've been I was involved in that program for 20 years. And at one point, um, when I you know, when I we got up to $2,500 scholarships for our participants, which I really value education, so that yeah. was uh, very helped people become successful. So I met you a while ago when you were young and just starting your family and you and some other uh, citizens and residents of Fridley got together and formed the Save Our Schools group. Right. Do you want to talk about that? That was a great effort on the part of our community coming together. My career has been creating community partnerships and when I saw that our schools were going to be having to cut programs like FIED, music, band and other um, really important um, educational opportunities for our students. I brought together teachers and educators, uh, senior citizens, parents, and even our students. And we got together and I rolled up our sleeves. We learned what was needed and we needed more funding from the state. They were really falling behind on their commitment to our schools. And we wanted to, our students to have these kind of opportunities. And so we fought for and we won needed funding for our school districts. And that was what ended up launching my legislative career because then uh, Representative Alice Johnson retired after that. And uh, being a legislator wasn't in my plans, but people in the community asked me to run because they knew how much I cared about education and um, advocate for our community. And so. Um, after saying no a couple times, I did say yes and glad I did and it was a great opportunity serving our community. So what, so what other civic activities did you get involved with and how did that uh, help you out in your uh, career as a representative? Well, growing up in our community, I think the most important thing was the relationships that I built with neighbors and friends and families and people that went to my church and people that um, played on sports with me and people that played on sports with my dad played softball for many years and coached uh, 
young people, myself and my brother and um, our church team. And so I just, all the relationships really helped me a lot. Serving on part the 49er committee for 20 years was also um, a great uh, way to see just how people give so much back to their community. Um, some people around here probably remember John Gargaro, Mr. Mm -hmm. Fridley, yes, and uh, now we have our, a second Mr. Fridley, which is our mayor, Scott Lund. I call yeah. him Mr. Fridley, too. And um, just seeing just what people, how they serve their community. And I remember going to John's funeral, and we got to say a message in the recorder, and I said, you know, I, I hope that I can give back to the community like you gave back. And uh, serving as a legislator really help me be able to fulfill my dream of um, having mentors and role models like him and others in our community. Yeah, yeah John, John was a big part of Fridley. Mm -hmm. So no, now let's get into your history of in the house. Mm -hmm. um, you served non-consecutive terms by choice. Why did you decide to retire the first time and what made you come back again? Right, well, thanks for asking that question. I served for six years because I wanted to, the first six years, I really wanted to go and help our students and really fight for the funding that our, our local schools needed. And um, I would, had the opportunity to, to do that. And then um, my kids were growing up and then they were gonna be like starting to plan their college uh, where they were gonna go. And I just didn't wanna miss out on their life and being able to help them do that. And so I retired not expecting to go back, but then redistricting happened, and the community said, you know, Connie, your kids are now grown and in, in college, and uh, you should run again. And our, my daughters told me, you know, Mom, you really loved it. I think you should, like, run again. And uh, so I had the opportunity to run again the last redistricting, and I went back and got to continue to work on education and um, transportation and um, many other things. So it really was a family decision. Yeah, this has been a family journey. When I first ran, when our kids were younger, it was like, well, let's look at this as an adventure. My parents uh, stayed with us and helped take care of the kids during the summer during campaigning when I would go door to door and visit people at their doors, which people are really appreciative of. They hear all these negative campaigns and they're like, wow, you came to my door. That really means a lot to me and they really respect that. And so. We, uh, it, it takes, it takes a fam, uh, it takes family support to be able to do this job well and to serve the community and the support of all of the community members. And that is what I'm going to miss the most, most people rolling up their sleeves and helping me on my campaign, coming down to the Capitol and telling me what their needs are and writing to me. That is um, serving the constituents and the needs of our community was the most important thing that I did in the legislature. So your, your passion for education stayed with you after the Save Our Schools Committee. Um, what came next? Well, when I got to the Capitol, I didn't realize how partisan uh, the education would be. I thought everybody would want to be fund our schools and make sure that our students had uh, the resources they needed and would be able to have the opportunities and be successful. And so I really worked hard to bring people together to get needed funding for our schools. And so some of my, um, I don't know, they were actually landmark legislation, all day kindergarten, we, we uh, funded it. That was my, I was a chief author of that bill so that uh, it would be covered, the expense. Uh, the parents had voluntary option to send their kids to kindergarten for a full day. and they wouldn't have to pay anything. And then also in our community, we have a number of preschool spots that uh, we're going to be uh, wiped out. And there's a lot of people in our community who need support and free preschool. And so I was able to get funding for 4,000 students across the state and for them to be able to go to school. And in the district I represent, it was for over 100 excuse me, it was over 100 students. So that was another area that was really important to me. And then when I returned to the legislature, I served on higher education and became the higher education chair. And for my parents who were teenage wed parents, who my mom went back to college when I was six, no, well actually she went back to work when I was six years old. Her boss told her, you know, you're really smart, you should go to college. 
And so she tried it out and she ended up being the top female freshman in her class at um, Anoka Ramsey when she went to school there. And I was just there for groundbreaking and I was able to speak and share our story to um, the groundbreaking of the nursing program. And that's where my mom got her nursing degree. And it just so happened they had a class picture from the 1970s and when I I said I want to go see if my mom's on that picture and sure enough class of 1973 there was my mom in that picture my mom later went on to earn her four-year nursing degree and then her master's degree and she worked at uh, the Twin City Army ammunition plant in um, Arden Hills as the occupational health nurse and so the doors that the opportunities that opened for my family because of education was really, really important. And I learned from my mom, and she was a first generation college student in her family, and uh, I was able to follow her and get my degree as well. And being able to be responsible and manage a close to about a three and a half billion dollar budget for higher education in the state of Minnesota truly was an honor. And we changed how we did business around higher ed in the state. We focused on our students and we brought them to the, I call it the tables of power, and we heard what their needs were. And we really focused on the support for our students, whether it was food insecurity and having, we had the first ever Hunger Free, Free Campus Act, mental health support services we got for our students, and we really worked to try to support our students so that they can be successful. So that was, um, education has been my whole career at the Capitol, as well as transportation. Okay. We, um, we may talk a little bit more about that yeah. next, but we'll get back, I, yeah, we'll get back to a, that. I got another a question about right, exactly. your education uh, career. How do you determine what needed, what was most needed? Uh, did you just figure that out or did you go visit schools and families and hold meetings or how did you determine what was the most needs? Well first you have your ear in the ground and you go to I, I would go door to door that's the best way to reach your constituents that's one thing and then every year I would have a meeting with the cities and the school districts before session after session and sometimes in between, finding out what the needs were, and then just listening to parents and um, going to community events and community meetings, and um, people would write you letters and you would hear what the needs are. And so that was um, always a priority of mine was to do whatever I can I could to help our help our students. Um, you just kind of mentioned transportation. What other commission or committees were you on? Well, I also, and you mentioned the word commission, and I actually served on the um, Legislative Audit Commission. So that wasn't a committee in the House, but it was a responsibility that I had. So when we spend money on state programs or we um, pass policies, this, would, this was an opportunity for me to help provide oversight in the state of Minnesota. So I love serving on that committee. I also served on the Ways and Means Committee and that as a senior member of the Minnesota House, all the finance chairs serve on that committee and um, they bring every single finance bill that goes to the Capitol has to come through that committee before it can hit the House floor for a vote. So you learn a lot in all the different areas in the House. And then I've served on the Rules Committee. That's where before a bill is able to go to the floor, it has to get on the calendar. And that's another committee that I served on. And then I've served on Tax Committee. And that was really important with um, how we fund our schools. So it's the element of funding our schools is not only um, about um, policies and how we teach our kids, but it's also about the mechanisms and how we get those funds yeah, to you school. Find the money. Right, exactly. So those are those are some of the I served on local government and um, policy and um, a number a few other committees, but my um, biggest committees were higher education committee, the education finance committee, 
Transportation Committee, the Ways and Means Committee, and this Legislative Audit Commission. And then I served on other task force at the Capitol as well. And so currently I'm serving on the Legislative Audit Commission as well as appointed by um, the Speaker to the Governor's Task Force on uh, uh, Connected and uh, uh, Automated Vehicles. Okay. So, and it focuses a little bit on electrification of vehicles and how we move people about, so. Okay, so w now transportation. You're very active in an upcoming project here that goes right through Fridley. You wanna talk about that one? Sure, well there's a couple big projects that's happening to Fridley. Fridley, and that's one of the things I really wanna do as a legislator. I really, really wanted to support my community and um, bring, um, resources to our community to make it stronger and uh, safer and our roadways they're they were they're very dangerous for people that are biking and walking and moving about in our community when cars move fast there's there can be deaths and serious injuries and so um, knowing a lot about transportation I was able to um, get MnDOT involved and uh, pass laws and not even out it didn't always require a law it co it required the attention of the Minnesota Department of Transportation and um, been able to bring up funding to our district to uh, make improvements on University Avenue and Central Avenue and so um, part of that picture was um, instead of focusing on uh, a safety problem here, a safety problem there. Let's look at the whole corridor, both on University Avenue and on Central Avenue and Highway 65 and how we move people along these corridors and make mm -hmm. it safer. So there's already been more safety improvements that are happening and more are gonna come. And then the other big project that um, we were able to, I was able to help get funding for and have been working on this for many years behind the scenes with the Metropolitan Council and that is getting a really, um, like upscale, um, really quality bus rapid transit system that provides more service to our community so people don't have to wait as long for a bus mm -hmm. and they can um, uh, really have quality transit service here. So that's exciting, so that's gonna be coming soon. Okay, and um, I guess you, you kind of mentioned that you worked with MnDOT also. Some year, it's, it's not just writing up a bill. You have to actually work with the the, the departments and right. the actual people doing things. Right, yeah, we would have um, meetings in my office with the commissioner quite frequently, and one of the commissioners told me yeah, they actually liked it when I kicked him in the, <laughs> kicked him in the butt because um, I, it reminded him the things that need to be get, needed to get done, and so I worked on a lot of, um, safety as it relates to the most vulnerable users in our state and um, people who uh, have uh, had disability, people who bike, people who walk, and they were just an afterthought in the past and now mm -hmm. they are a part of our planning. So now the state has plans. It's, they have changed immensely and that wasn't an easy thing to make happen, but it's happened. Yeah. And then the other, the other areas around equity making sure that our system is equitable to all, to people of all backgrounds and that um, we make sure that everyone gets the kind of service that they need. And then the other area of transportation I worked really hard on is the environmental. So when I first started working on it, it was kind of like an aspirational goal. Well, I, I was able to get the Minnesota Department of Transportation to start doing actual performance measures to environmental goals and mm -hmm. um, it's really taken off and there's sustainability um, division now and there's, uh, I've worked on a lot of pollinator corridor work and I was just um, admiring the water, the um, along 35W today, all the flowers in the, along in the grass and everything. Okay. So it's, uh, you know, our pollinators are really important to our state and our transportation system has a huge infrastructure in which we can use to make corridors. So I call them B highways or mm -hmm. B ways. And yeah. um, 
we're going to get more of those over the state over the years. And so there's a lot more work that needs to be done. And um, I'm really proud to say that the work is in place to be able to get the bus rapid transit and to further the safety improvements. And so we're going to have some, um, a lot of work happening here in 2024 is when it's uh, more work is, and we're doing it, continually doing it, and that's when the big project is coming. Okay. So I, it's it's more than just building a new road or, or mm -hmm. putting some more, more black top down or something. You, you, You've got the the environmental fingers and <laughs> and all kinds of things involved, and which uh, creates improvements for the environment too. If mm -hmm. you if it works together, exactly properly. because transportation is our big is is like our biggest polluter in our state, and so anything we can do to help uh, reduce that pollution will help us in our future and uh, and us meet our goals. So we have a lot of work to do. We have to stay. Um, we have to stay on it and just make sure that we do all we can to um, be able to have a great state and have an infrastructure that keeps people safe. Okay. So over your 16 years of service, um, I'm sure you've done a lot of things, but what are some of your, your um, proudest accomplishments? Well, I thank you for asking that. You know, uh, one of our gems in our community is the Springbrook Nature Center, and I was the um, able to be the chief author and work to bring five million with our community. Uh, we had a great community group that worked together uh, very hard to make it happen, and was able to pass into law five million dollars to build the new Springbrook Interpretive Center. So that was really big for our community. And then even before that, Springbrook was just being decimated by pollution and water run, runoff that just destroyed the plants and the habitat and the an, animals in that area. And I was um, able to write legislation that allowed us to get funding for um, clean water funding that we were able to restore the wetlands at the Springbrook Nature mm -hmm. Center and it was the first wetland restoration project, urban wetland restoration project of its kind in the country and um, even though the animals came back, the plants came back and that is something I'm very proud of too. I also helped spearhead the United States Environmental Protection Agency, we got that right, Pollution Agency, whatever, okay. EPA, EPA. <laughs> and um, to start a citizen advisory group in um, Fridley to talk about our Superfund sites and to really help educate people about, um, about what's happened and moving forward and those sorts of things because there was a lot of distrust and it was really to empower the commu our community and to build relationships with um, our civic leaders and uh, that was that was quite successful and people got information and resources came to our community to help people become informed and to help you know make um, good choices and those sorts of things and I think I mentioned that earlier I didn't mean I mentioned that my mom worked at a super fun site at the Twin City Army Army ammunition plant mm -hmm. my dad worked in manufacturing and worked at uh, contaminated site you know we didn't know when he was working there but it later became a contaminated site in Fridley as well okay. so that's why clean water and the environment has been super important to me and then um, I would say getting all the attention and funding to make our, our road safer in our community along University and Central Avenue bringing the bus rapid transit to our community has been a big accomplishment and then uh, just uh, being able to be successful in passing important education funding for our schools and I would say in uh, becoming the higher education chair in the Minnesota House and being responsible for uh, a budget and the values in which we care about our students and how we can support them in the state and make them help them be successful those I would say are the biggest accomplishments. I remember the pond um, restoration. It was, is the, people didn't realize that that big pond that we had out at Springbrook at the time actually didn't belong there. So when, when they, part of that pollution control is they, they emptied the pond, let, let the cock, uh, cattails grow 
grow back and the habitat, and like you said, the animals did return. Now, was that part of the spring project that we've actually just completed that? Were you involved well, in that? actually, the spring project is the funding for the interpretive center and all, you know, building a facility and that we can like have last for years and that mm -hmm. people can love the park. That was separate. So that was clean water funding that I was able to pass uh, my freshman year in the legislature in a divided legislator. And a freshman legislator doesn't get legislation really passed very often in a legislation in a legislature where you um, need Republicans to come over and help support your bill. And I was a people gasp in the when my bill passed, which helped us get the funding for uh, restoring the wetlands of the Springbrook Nature Center. People just gasp. They're like, oh my goodness. And I was like so excited and then it passed and I went in the retirement room and people were excited about it. And then they took the boat back up. And so, and I thought, oh my goodness, now they could like kill my vote because it passed. I had two Republicans okay. join me and passed it. Well, they brought it back up for a vote and they actually passed with more than a hundred votes because they knew it was good for the environment and people didn't want to be against clean water and I got even more votes for my bill and that's how we got the funding for the Springbrook Nature Center wetland restoration project. Well the whole area appreciates your hard work on that. Thank I know, you. I know it was more than just one one little trip down for the mayor and and Malcolm and them to uh, to get the funding and you were uh, a big part of that. Right, yeah, so that was, a, that, was that huge project um, in getting the Springbrook Interpretive Center building built and that just took huge community effort and um, oh, persistence and to be the chief author of that bill and help get across the finish line was truly an honor and it's nice to be able to go out there and see so many people enjoying it and children learning and adults yeah relaxing there and watching the birds and the turkeys and the deer, all those things. So it, it, you're, you're a, a representative in the House, mm -hmm. but we also have the Senate. Um, how do the two bodies work together and what's the importance of that? Well, it's really important that we work together because we need to get legislation passed. And uh, the fun part about that is I would I worked as the higher education chair. I worked really well with my counterpart in the Senate, which was the different party. And we would uh, be the first ones done with our bill. And in fact, one legislative session, we were the only one, the only committee, the higher education committee, finance committee, to pass their bill without having to go to special session. So those are the kinds of things that I like to do, like get the job done, collaborate, work together. I was part uh, of trained in this, the National Institute of Civil Discourse. And this comes out of Arizona and where um, Congresswoman Gabby Gifford was shot. And our um, two presidents of the United States, uh, President, uh, former President Clinton and former President George W. Bush were the chairs of this committee and what we did is um, I was one of the first 25 or 35 trained um, next generation facilitators and what I did is uh, learn how to get legislators to be able to work together and the goal of it is at the in the legislatures across the country oftentimes they go on to Congress and high uh, Congress and if we can get our legislators to work, then hopefully maybe the, these skills will be taken into Congress and things will work in at the federal level. And so I had the opportunity to use those skills and help uh, bring people together at the Minnesota State Capitol, as well as um, I went to another state capitol, and actually it was Idaho, and spent a, a day with all the legislatures and helping them work together and bring people together. And a lot of it's building relationship and building trust with one another. And so creating opportunities to do that and being intentional about that, that is something that, you know, I never threw up my hands and said, let, you know, it's just so frustrating. 
I just like rolled up my sleeves, tried to gain the skills that I needed, tried to help uh, work and bring other people together, and then also in my role as the higher education chair, get the job done. And then in other areas in transportation, working across the aisle too on safety of our roadway workers, that is um, something that I've been working on as well. So there's lots of areas where you can come together and those are areas of great accomplishment at the Capitol too. So like most of the rest of the country, after the census, you were redistricted and uh, you chose to retire. What's next? Um, are you, you going to continue to serve the, the community somehow? Well, I love serving our community, and so that's in my blood. I expect that to continue in some way, shape, or fashion. I um, plan to be an election judge. I'm really eager to do that. I couldn't do that as a legislator, and uh, we, we are in dire need of election judges, so I'm hoping that other people join me and um, become election judges. I um, when my when redistricting happened, the district did the district. I had five percent of my district left, and the rest was in um, the district got split into three districts and two senate districts, and so that's how things happen. And um, I'm really uh, love serving our community, and I would have loved to continue serving it. It wasn't in the cards with redistricting, and I'm just really looking forward to the next chapter and. Um, what life has in store and how I can be of help to our community and state. Okay, so um, do you want to talk about what your plans are? Do you have plans yet for the future or are you just going to wing it? <laughs> I, 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 um, I, I think I'm going to wing it. I, this is a nice time in my life just to sit back and see what the next chapter holds and I um, I'm excited about that. I, I uh, have a great family. I can't wait to spend more time with them, and um, uh, I'll, I'll continue working and really just look forward to the next chapter and see what happens. Do you have any parting messages for, for the community that you served? Well, first of all, thank you, thank you, thank you. It has been an honor representing our community and the support that I have have gotten is um, truly very touching and I'm it's just going to be a fond memory that I carry with me forever. We have an incredible, incredible community. We're right here on top of the Twin Cities. We have a community that values education. We have a community that values the environment and we have a community that is really hard workers. That's one of the values I grew up here is learning really hard work and about education and um, working together. And I believe that the tornado that went through Fridley back in 1965 really laid the groundwork of Fridley uh, community members caring about each one another and helping one another. And I, that's how, that's, that's what they taught me as a young girl here growing up in Fridley. And I am um, gonna continue that throughout my life and carry Fridley with me. And um, hopefully I'll get to see um, lots of people along the way on this journey and I'm so honored to have been um, a part of um, all the great things that we did, get, did together over the last 20 years. Well, I, I'd like to thank you for your service to the area. Thank you. Yes. Well, thank you, Connie, for agreeing to uh, come in and talk with us today. And best wishes and enjoy your time with your family. I know that being a, a representative um, takes a lot of time, especially when in session, but it, it, I know it's not an eight hour work day. Mm -hmm. So um, I know your family also sacrificed for your service to us. So enjoy uh, your retirement from the uh, house and I hope we see you around the community. Thank you, Brian, and thank you for your service for these last 30 years, too. It's been fun being on the same uh, circuit with you and the same journey, so thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have two exciting events coming up in October. Ready to go? I don't even know what to say. Okay. <clears throat> 
We have some exciting things coming up here at Springbrook Nature Center in the fall. And the one of the most exciting days is our pumpkin night in the park event on October 22nd from 5 to 9 p.m. So please save the date, get your tickets in advance. You can buy them online at springbrooknaturecenter.org or you can come in and buy a ticket at Springbrook Nature Center or Civic Campus, City of Fridley. Get them quick. Whew, oof, duh. Well, this is number one of 1,200 pumpkins that I need to carve for Pumpkin Night in the Park on October 22nd. It would sure be nice to have some help. Maybe you could help me. Yeah, that'd be great. Come to our community carving event taking place from October 16th through October 22nd, um, and you can carve your own pre-gutted pumpkin for free and find it on our trails during our pumpkin night in the park event. Uh, you can sign up online at springbrooknaturecenter.org and please sign up in advance. And remember, it's all free. I hope to see you there. Hi, I'm James Lang, Fire Marshal and Chief Two with Fridley Fire Department. Here to tell you today about our upcoming open house on October 8th uh, from 10 to 2 at Fire Station 1. Uh, our open house is going to have all kinds of events such as uh, fire truck demonstrations. You'll be able to get lots of information on how to keep your home and loved ones safe from fire danger. And of course, we always have lots of demonstrations on hand. So we'll look forward to seeing you there again October 8th. That's it for this month's Community Connection. Please be sure to subscribe to email updates and follow the City of Fridley on Facebook Instagram, Nextdoor, LinkedIn, and Twitter. I'm Brian Strand, and thank you for watching Fridley Municipal Television. This has been a production of Fridley Municipal Television. Thanks for watching.